All right. Okay, so before we start this lesson, I'm going to give an overview of how the six weeks is going to go. That way there's no surprises along the way and you know where we're going. The first lesson this week is uh, why should we study scripture? So I'm going to go over some biblical reasons why we should study scripture. You guys can tell me the personal reasons why you want to study scripture. I'll give a personal reason why I want to teach this class. Um, the second week is the, the backbone of the entire six weeks. Okay, the second week will be the most important week. The reason I'm saying that is we're going to go over proper Bible study mechanics the second week. All right, and then the third week, part of doing proper Bible study is uh, consulting uh, commentaries, right? And maybe having a study Bible or going to websites or something like that. And we're going to go over how to do that because what I've seen a lot of people when they get their first commentary or their first study Bible, they treat the commentary like a commentary of scripture. They almost gloss over scripture and go straight to commentary and say, what am I supposed to believe about this? And I want to kill that habit before it starts. Um, and uh, we'll go over how to choose a commentary, how to use a commentary, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, and then the fourth week, we're going to go verse by verse. Okay, this is sort of backbone of Bible study, verse by verse. I have some stuff picked out already as like examples we're going to do. And then the rest of that verse by verse lesson is going to be something you guys choose to do. We'll all choose together what to go, what to do. The fifth week will be a topical study. So once you can verse by verse, then you can ask the Bible a question. What does the New Testament have to say about marriage? You know what I mean? What, is, you know, what does the Bible actually say about slavery? Those sorts of things. Once you can do verse by verse, then you can ask the Bible questions, right? Um, and then the last thing, the last week we're going to do is uh, reconcile and tension in Scripture. And the example I gave in, uh, in the post on Facebook about it was um, Paul and James in Faith and Works. What role do they play in salvation? Because on a first glance, they look like they contradict each other. If you read James and Romans, right, they'll look like they contradict each other. And so how do you reconcile? And that's, that's one example, but like I said, Anytime we're using an example, I'll have an example, and then you guys will, will come together and decide what we're going to do um, that week uh, for scripture study. Um, and so this first lesson might feel like a bit of a bait and switch. You guys came to a how to study the Bible class, and that ended up being a why should you study the Bible class. And the reason I wanted to do that was because if we get our motivations out here personally and biblically, like uh, mandates to all Christians, then hopefully that will help carry you for six weeks. Right? And two years from now, when we haven't been studying your Bible for months, you know, you'll remember these motivations and get back to it. Um, but hopefully, you know, week four, week five, week six, you know, kind of comes along and you remember, why am I doing this to begin with? And when you, you know, face the decision of relaxing in your pajamas or coming up here, you come back up here. Mm -hmm. um, another reason I wanted to go over this first is because one thing I noticed with the youth, um, and all Christians really, but the youth this year specifically, is that when I when I did a lesson on say baptism, right? And all the youth said the Baptist thing back to me. Baptism is an outward sign of member change. Almost all of them said that like parrots. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> and I said chapter verse, right? And all of them didn't even know what I meant. I said, you tell me in the Bible where those words are strung together in that sentence. Because they're not, right? That is a result of Bible study, right? But um, to just take that as what the Bible says about baptism is sort of like me explaining to you the movie Jurassic Park and then you acting like you saw the movie. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what it's like. Because when I pushed back and I said the Bible never says that, a lot of them got very offended, mm -hmm. right? Because they've just been believing what they've been told. Well, you've gotten the cliff notes of Scripture, but you have not gotten Scripture, mm -hmm. right? And so what we did was kind of methodically went through uh, the text about baptism. And draw, we drew a conclusion from it, but your conclusions are not scripture. That's just your best explanation of the, the information in scripture, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we ultimately landed back in the same place, right? As Baptists, we think we have the right understanding. Um, but, so some of the kids after that was like, well, why did you tell me I was wrong? And I said, it's just like a math teacher asking you to show your work, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You have to test it with scripture. Um, I don't care if Pastor Ted told you this, you're going to get a kid who's Anglican pastor told, or Anglican priest told him something else. Right? Or you go across the street and talk to the Catholics, they're going to tell you something else. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to um, give reasons for why you believe what you believe. And so tonight is going to be similar to that. Why should we study the Bible? And then we'll get to the how you know, we're going to study the Bible. Um, so I guess the first question is, why do you guys want to get better at studying the Bible? Be the spiritual leader and uh, be able to answer questions whenever the kids come to me. Or, you know, yeah. uh, and to be able to defend my faith. Yeah, those are all great reasons. Um, 
One thing with the questions that kids have, a lot of times you're not going to know right away. But if you have proper Bible study you know, skills, you can go, oh, okay, here's the passage, you know, here's the um, back up a little bit, read, 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 you know, where you're at, keep reading, read, read. You got to follow thoughts, you know what I mean? Uh, one thing I've noticed people do is like dissect scripture to the point where you would never do this if someone wrote you a letter. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And only read one sentence and try to, try to make you know, something out of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are good, great reasons. Anybody else? Encouragement. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. yeah. And I just want to get into the word. Yeah. I know it, so. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we'll definitely be doing that. Well, basically, just what you were saying. You can hear everybody talk and say something, but you need to reinforce and know for yourself right. why you believe the way you're believing. Yeah, yeah. One thing you also be able to do is disagree well, right? Um, sometimes people get offended and they can't disagree well. Uh, and I'm going to show you commentaries of PhD Christians who spent their entire lives studying the Bible and come to completely different conclusions. And one of the things you got to realize is there's people on all sides of every issue that are just as educated as the other people, you know, and they speak with just as much authority as the other person. And what you have to do is weigh their arguments and look at the text and bring it back, constantly be bringing it back to the text. Constantly bring it back to the text. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, I guess uh, I'm teaching the class because Ted brought up that there were some needs in the church, which I was completely blind to, unaware of, which were some people wanted to learn how to study the Bible on their own, and then the other one was uh, young adults. It was like a gap that needed to be filled. And I was going to do that, and then we thought we had somebody to do that instead, and he backed out. And so now I'm doing this. I don't know who's going to do the young adult thing. Maybe someone younger than me. Um, I don't know. But first what we'll do is um, look at what Jesus had to say about Scripture. Now, what do we have to keep in mind when we learn about what Jesus had to say about Scripture? If Jesus on the earth was talking about Scripture, what is he actually talking about? Truth. Truth, yeah. But there wasn't a... Bible. There wasn't a Bible, there wasn't a specifically a New Testament. Yeah. Right? So when Jesus is talking about Scripture, you have to understand that applies to the Old Testament. Right? He's not talking about Scripture that's not written yet. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Alright. So, uh, does anybody want to read this for me? Anybody see it? I can read it if you want to. Oh, okay. Then Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstools. Therefore David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. All right. So um, if we were doing like proper verse by verse Bible study, there's a whole bunch of stuff here, right? That's pretty incredible. Um, but this is this is Jesus' like claim to divinity here, right? Um, but also, what what we're laser focused on right now is we're, we're trying to focus on what can we learn about Scripture from the words of Jesus, okay? And so, what can we learn about the Old Testament, specifically Psalm 110, the first verse or two in Psalm 110, um, that Jesus has to say? I highlighted it already, so kind of <laughs> cheated. But um, what can we learn about Scripture from the words of Jesus here? At least how, what he thought about Scripture. Right? This is what Jesus thinks about Scripture. It's most by the Holy Spirit. Right, right. So um, something we're learning from this is somehow David said something by the Holy Spirit. Right? David said something by the Holy Spirit. And so what we can say is it's human. Uh, uh -oh. Sorry. And divine. I got it. <laughs> human and divine. Scripture is somehow human and divine. Now what do we usually call that? Divine inspiration. Divine inspiration. So, me is human and divine. Now, we'll run into trouble anytime, uh, divine. Anytime we, we, uh, anytime we, uh, overrule one over the other. Okay, you will run into trouble. If you, um, think scripture is only divine, you're going to have a real hard time making sense of some of Paul's letters. Right? Paul forgets things in his letters. Um, and he actually misspeaks a couple times. Like in 1 Corinthians, he says, I'm thankful I baptized none of you. Except this one guy and this other guy and this household. But other than that, I don't think I baptized anybody. Right? So it's, it's somehow it's human and divine. It's something we're learning from Jesus. Um, and um, 
And there's another, there's another point where Paul says, and I forgot my coat over here, but make sure you bring it when you come. You know, it's very human in nature. But God somehow is communicating through the human author. Right? And so Jesus, to make a point, appealed to Scripture. That he's saying is that uh, human and divine. And one thing he must see it here as is authoritative. Right? Authoritative. So he thinks that referencing this scripture as a authority, right? He's making his whole argument on something that David wrote um, that he sees as still having a theory over Jewish leadership at the time. So, um, and uh, us Protestants, right, will see something like this and say this is how scripture is over the church as well, right? Whereas a uh, Catholic and Orthodox will see uh, scripture and sacred tradition almost as equal, mm -hmm. right? Sacred tradition tells you what to think about scripture. So really, like a Protestant, we're going to say that actually puts a higher than scripture. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, but for us, this is this is a good example of it's human and divine, and also authoritative because this is what Jesus. His whole argument depends on that this is true. You know, and that, um, it's inspired. So John 10:34, 36. Anybody want to read that? Jesus answered them, "Is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods." If he called them their gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and said unto the world, You are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? Alright. What I am not going to do is try to explain this argument that Jesus gave. Okay? Because this is a pretty controversial uh, statement that he says here. But um, what, uh, I guess the question is, Jesus. Jesus' argument hinges on one word in the Old Testament, right? They're saying he's blaspheming because he says he's the Son of God. Jesus' argument hinges on one word, right? You are gods. That's the quote that he gives, okay? And then he says, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him uh, uh, whom the Father sanctified and said to the world, you are blaspheming? So his, his whole argument hinges on one word, gods. And that tells us that Jesus thinks that scripture is true down to the very word level. One word. That's his whole, right? True um, down to the word. Word. Right? So it's not just the big ideas of scripture. It's not just the themes in scripture. Jesus made an argument. And Paul actually does the same thing with the word seed. Right? Um, and he, when he says, it doesn't say seeds, it says seed. Right? He's trying to make the case for uh, Jesus' messiahship. But um, both of them make an argument just like this. One word, and even the, uh, the uh, whether it's singular or plural, like, that's how that's how tight these arguments are. Mm -hmm. Jesus thinks that uh, Scripture is human and divine, authoritative and true down to the very word level. Um, and then there's this other phrase here, and the Scripture cannot be broken. Mm -hmm. uh, that word, I went through like 20 translations really fast, <laughs> is sometimes called, is, is sometimes translated broken, undone, annulled. Right? So those are the various ways you can do it. You can't annul something God said. You can't break what God has said through Scripture. Um, you can't like remove its power somehow. And so, um, yeah, that's what we're learning there about Jesus or about what Jesus thought about Scripture. Now, this that is all Old Testament stuff. And this, this is Jesus commissioning people um, to go spread his message. Um, and so someone could read that. And yeah. It will start to talk about the New Testament. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, <clears throat> that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning them. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Alright, so the first thing we can notice here is that this, this long phrase here, the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, he refers to them as scriptures. Mm -hmm. Right? And so this is a uh, shorthand way, back then, of referring to all Jewish scriptures at the time. Uh, sometimes we'll say the Law and the Prophets, sometimes we'll say uh, the Law and the Psalms, and leave out the Prophets part, but all of it is considered, uh, this is Jesus affirming what we call the Old Testament canon, like the list of authoritative scriptures at the time that he was one. And um, he says something uh, unique about them, in that there's at least some part that all things must be fulfilled which were written in those concerning me. Right? So Jesus himself sees that some of the old, at least some of the Old Testament, was written concerning himself. Right? And so he's saying that these things had to happen to fulfill that. Right? Um, 
we'll go over the canon here in a little while. Yeah, is that, so that's fair to say where it says the law of Moses the prophets, I thought that's a summary of the Old Testament canon. Yeah, that's a way, if you, if you they, they never say the Old Testament, yeah. right? Okay. Obviously, because there was only one at the time. <laughs> but what they'll say is either the scriptures, or they'll say something like the law of the prophets, or the law of the prophets and the Psalms, or the, mm -hmm. uh, um, those are usually the two ways I think you said it. Um, but that's just their way of referring to Jewish scripture at the time. And so that's uh, one thing. And then the, the second thing is some of that had, even back then, they were writing concerning Jesus. And obviously, if you've been in church very long, we'll read Old Testament things and go, oh, this is you know, tied to the New Testament. Um, and then this last phrase is crucially important for us as Christians. Crucially important. He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Who is the they? Those are his disciples, right? And so um, when we see the, uh, Paul or anyone else, uh, Paul's not here present at this time, but if we see Peter write something down, giving commentary on the Old Testament or interpreting something in the Old Testament, that's authoritative. Jesus himself opened his mind to understand the Old Testament, right? So they have what we would call uh, apostolic authority, okay, to interpret the Old Testament. And usually, some, sometimes they'll interpret it in a way where you're like, what the heck are they talking about? That does not seem like what was going on in the Old Testament. And that's because they're interpreting it through the lens that is Christ, that came. We call it the Christ event. The Christ event has happened now, right? The thing, God became a man, right? Uh, uh, lived his perfect life, died, sinned, or I mean, died, descended to hell, rose again, um, ascended on high. So they're, they're, they can't read it any other way. This was pointing to Christ, you know what I mean? And so when they give an interpretation of the Old Testament, that's authoritative, right? When Paul in Romans tells you uh, that um, Adam's sinning led to condemnation for everyone, which, you know, we can go through that. The condemnation is death. But when, when Paul says that, even though the Old Testament didn't explicitly say that out loud, that's authoritative, you know, when Paul explains those things. Um, so that, that's going to be huge going forward. So those are the original 11 that were left at the time, right? And so what we'll see here, moving on to the New Testament, this is 1 Corinthians 15. Now three, depending on which scholar you talk to, uh, three to six or three to eight. Most of them probably say three to six. This is, now if you read Paul's writings, you will find in them nuggets that they call um, creeds, okay? And the reason they'll call them creeds is because they don't sound like Paul and they read with a cadence. Da, 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 da. And so when you're teaching, um, like small children who don't know how to read, you teach them things with songs, right? Mm -hmm. And so the early church couldn't, obviously most of them couldn't read. And so what we find are early Christian creeds that actually predate the New Testament. This creed, uh, most New Testament scholars will, will date to the 30s, okay? It has to be early. Mm -hmm. And the reason it has to be early is because Paul cites it here of first importance up there. And this translation calls it first of all, but in most modern translations you'll see the phrase of first importance. And um, Paul at least verified the gospel with Peter a few years after he's converted. Okay? He says he's converted, he goes out to the wilderness for a few years, it's in Galatians, and then he says he went to Jerusalem and met with Peter, James, and John. And he asked them, uh, he basically tested his gospel against their gospel, and then he follows it up with a phrase, and they added nothing to me. Right? So I was preaching the gospel. So Paul at least knows this creed in the, the mid-30s. For I delivered to you of first importance, uh, all that which I uh, also received, that Christ, this is the creed part, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures, uh, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. And so anything, you know, the one thing that will mess you up reading scripture is if you have other translations memorized, mm -hmm. it'll trip you up. Anyway, um, what we learned here are other people that are commissioned, right? Peter and the twelve were there already, but now we learn James, the brother of Jesus, is commissioned by Jesus after his death and resurrection, and then Paul says, me also, right? And so this is a furthering of the commission. Um, the sort of the qualifier to be an apostle, the capital A apostle, is you had to have seen the risen Jesus, right? Um, so here is, like, a, like I'm saying, this is another one of those gold mines if we were doing a real Bible study. But for our purposes tonight, we're asking the question what to think about Scripture. Jesus commissioned his disciples, apostles, to um, 
fully understand the Old Testament in light of what he had done. Right? And this is just sort of furthering that to his brother James and Paul. And actually, once we get here, we have the original 12, we have James, and we have Paul. We are pretty close to a full New Testament if you count these people and the people under their direction. Right? These people and the people under their direction. So Luke obviously wrote and is not one of twelve, and is not Paul, and is not James. Um, Mark obviously wrote, and he's not either of these. Um, and then Jude, and whoever wrote Hebrews. Okay? So Mark is under the guidance of Peter. Now church tradition says that Mark's gospel is Peter's gospel. Mark wrote down what Peter told him, right? Or sermons that he whole heard from Peter. And that's how, and that's how. One way, one way you can tell from the text, right? Because we don't want to base it solely on church tradition. Like, one way, way you can tell from the text is almost every time if you read the Gospel of Mark when it mentions the disciples, they'll say Peter and the others. Peter and the others. And it's almost like Peter was telling them. Yeah, me and the guys went down here. Me and the guys went down here, right? And if you go back and read it, now you'll see it. Almost every time it goes Peter and the twelve. Peter and the twelve. And it's a, the way that you know, Peter was telling them what to do. Um, and then Luke is under the direction of Paul. Right? So they're either apostles or what we call apostolic men, which are people under the direction of the apostles. Then uh, you basically have the New Testament other than whoever wrote Hebrews and Jude, uh, Jesus' other brother. Right? Jude, Jesus' other brother. Um, <clears throat> just from the commissioning. Now, now we're going to see how do um, Jesus' apostles see each other's writings? How do they see scripture themselves, right? No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Um, and so what we see here is Peter keeping the same, the same idea of Peter, right? Keeping that same idea going as the New Testament is being written. As the New Testament is being written, Peter is still saying that at least the prophecies you find in scripture are this human divine thing. If someone is being carried along by the Holy Spirit, as they say. Now, do you guys know what this means when you see text in um, italics in your Bible? I mean, they were in the original text. Yeah. Right, they're added. Um, so, a lot of times, uh, Greek sentences just look weird in English, <laughs> right? And so, the, the translators have to make it a complete sentence okay. in English. A lot of times, it's just, in, there's rules in Greek, it's just implied from before, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so, this is why it's always a good idea, we'll get into it next week, it's always a good idea to have multiple Bible translations, so you can be compared. Um, unless we're going to, you know, all get PhDs in Greek, you know, you, you have to depend on translators, you know. Um, and we'll go over good and bad next week, briefly at least, um, good and bad translations. Uh, I try to keep, like, at least one, what, what we call, like, almost strict word for word, and then one thought for thought, which is usually the NIV, so, and you kind of compare the two, because some, sometimes... The idea is one translation is trying to stick as close to the words as possible, the other one is trying to stick as close to the complete thoughts as possible. And you'll get different differences by when you do that, right? You'll get differences. But if you're if you're comparing both all the time, you kind of get a, a better understanding when the authors get that. Um, but here, again, this is just Peter affirming the same things that Jesus already said about the Old Testament as scripture is still being written. Now, this is a golden nugget, even for apologetics purposes. Um, if somebody wants to read that for me, you'll probably see why. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. All right, so that's killer. The main thing I want to point out here is that Peter just affirmed Paul's letters as scripture, right? So you see, as the New Testament is being written, right, it's not done yet, Paul's not mentioned to be dead, you know, Peter's obviously alive writing this. He is affirming that um, Paul's letters are just like the other scriptures, okay? So these guys, at least at some level, understood that what each of them were writing is authoritative and true, just like these are. Divine, divinely inspired, just like these are. And so, um, now what we have is sort of the same case for the New Testament as we have for the Old Testament. Right? The same things Jesus was saying about that are the same things that the people he commissioned are saying about their own writings. And so, um, 
And I know this is a, I'm, I'm doing a lot of things to prove things you guys already believe. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> We're doing a lot of text work here to prove things that you already believe. And the reason, the reason I'm doing that is because this is going to be our foundation moving forward, right? Um, and if you just uh, sort of, I just believe that the Bible is inerrant. I just believe that it was inspired. If you don't like have sort of Bible things in the back of your mind, backing those up, uh, I, I tell the kids all the time, and you guys are obviously not the youth, but I tell them all the time, you have to actually know why you believe what you believe. Okay? Because one day you're going to get older, right, and you're going to be tempted by whatever it is to just go somewhere, some other way. And you have to have this sort of firm foundation you keep coming back to. Um, is that all I had to say about that one? Yes. And so this is um, Paul writing to Timothy. Uh, this is like the highest scripture passage there is. Mm -hmm. Passage actually talking about scripture. This is as close as you get to what the process is called sola scriptura in the whole Bible. Okay? Um, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so here we see Paul affirm all scripture again, inspired by God, um, and then he talks about all the things you can do with scripture, all the things that scripture can do for you. It ought to be, you know, your testing rod for all these things. Um, and if you don't know this, like when we in the West talk about doctrine, we usually talk, I got the doctrine of the Trinity, and that's the, the God is one being made up of three persons, you know, somehow. Paul almost never means that. If you watch, when Paul uses that word doctrine, he's talking about the ways you live. I mean, I don't think there's an exception to that. If you see this, the problem for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, all that has to do with the way you're living. You know, instruction and righteousness. Um, he's almost never, I don't, I can't think of an example right now where he says doctrine and he means like correct beliefs about something. It's a correct way of living. Um, but that phrase, uh, given by inspiration of God, that uh, sort of literally translates to God breathed. And there's a there's healthy debate on what, what exactly that means. Um, one is God breathed, like God breathed. But that phrase is sort of used uh, the same as uh, when God gave life to Adam, right? He breathed his spirit into him. And so that phrase can actually just mean uh, life giving. And so um, uh, either way, this is a very high view of scripture. Whether you're saying that God breathed it out as in he spoke it and then the author wrote it down, or if you're saying that it's life giving. Either way, this is a very high degree uh, or a high view of scripture. He says that a man of God can be complete, thoroughly equipped if he's just, you know, testing himself with Scripture. And so, um, yeah, that is, uh, which, you know, after that we're going to talk about something, that is a nutshell, like what the Bible says about itself, right? And so, the reason all Christians should study Scripture is because it's good for these things. You know what I mean? We said it's human and divine, it's authoritative, it's true down to the word level. And then, boom, Paul is trying to tell you, look at it, look at it. If you just use scripture, right, to measure yourself. Um, so that is why all Christians should study the Bible, right? We talk about personally why, why we want to study the Bible, but this is why all Christians should study the Bible. Now, what is the Bible? That's, that's actually the, the next question. What is the Bible? Because there is no table of contents that's inspired. Okay, there's no inspired table of contents in the Bible. What you have... You know, what you have in front of you is a Protestant Bible, right? It has 66 books, right? It has 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books. The 39 are established from the words of Jesus. He never says these 39 books because they don't even count them. They have 22 because they combine them. Um, but when he says the law and the prophets, right, and the Psalms, that's, that's where we get these. That's where we get these ideas. Um, that's where we get, uh, so as, as like Martin Luther or John Calvin, these reformers, they come along and they want only the oldest, most early affirmed books, right? And so what we find is, it doesn't seem like Jesus affirmed anything after the Old Testament closes, what we call the Old Testament closes. It doesn't seem like Jewish like intellectuals at the time did either. Okay, so like Josephus says, that it had been 400 years since they received a word from God. And that lines up to the Old Testament. Josephus is a first century Jewish historian. He's pretty well respected, even though he's a traitor. Right? <laughs> um, but, uh, so Catholics believe in Catholics and Orthodox folks have intertestamental books, books in between the testaments that are in their Old Testament. So Catholics have um, more than us. Orthodox folks have even more, have even more. Okay, and that's where those books come from. If you ever wonder where those books come from, depending on the Orthodox Church you're talking about, it's a lot more.
All right, I'm sorry about that. My camera cut off. And so now we're finishing at my house. So, our um, conclusions are that the Bible is inspired, inerrant, authoritative, and distinct. Uh, and we believe that because of the scriptures that we went over earlier. Um, I know that most of you believe this already, but I wanted us first to hammer out the reasons why we believe these things from the Bible before we moved on. Um, now, we can believe that someone today spoke prophecy and that they were inspired, right? But we don't believe automatically that they're inerrant because we're going to test all, script, uh, all spirits with Scripture. Uh, we can believe that a math textbook has no errors in it. That doesn't mean it was inspired by God, right? Um, and we believe in you know, different authorities. And one sort of uniquely Protestant view of the Bible is that last one, distinct. Um, whether you're Catholic or Orthodox, you're going to believe that you have scripture and your sacred tradition and both of those uh, are at the same level whereas Protestants are going to say all traditions ought to be tested against scripture because scripture is God's distinct way of communicating with humans um, so there's that those were our conclusions there's nobody here to talk to me now alright for homework this is what we're going to do we're going to set up next week um, we're going to talk, uh, first I'm going to hammer out the big picture story, the uh, $3 word for that is the meta-narrative of scripture, right? And so the whole Bible is telling a story about creation, fall, redemption, new creation. So creation you can find obviously in the first two chapters of Genesis, the fall happens in the third chapter, and redemption actually starts immediately after that, where God gives what we call the proto-gospel, where he starts to talk about um, the seed of Eve crushing the head of the serpent. And then the entire Old Testament leading up to the New Testament is God working out that redemptive plan where it finally culminates in the Gospels. Um, and then new creation. New creation, there's some dis disagreement. Uh, I'm going to say that new creation has already begun. Right? Every believer that's regenerated, the Holy Spirit comes and gives a new heart. That is part of the new creation. God's church is part of his new creation. Uh, some people are going to disagree about that. I'm not going to uh, you know, quibble about it too much. Um, so you might just say that no, a new creation is what happens at the end of the book of Revelation. So keeping those big picture, um, monumental uh, occurrences in the Bible in mind while we're studying scripture is going to be important. The next thing we need to keep in mind is that the Bible is actually like a small library. It has 66 documents contained in it. And what that means for us is there's all different kinds of literature in the Bible. Uh, there is narrative, which can be broken up into history and biography, right? Um, so examples of history are like First and Second Kings. Um, an example of the bio of biographies are, you don't know the story? The ground. Four Gospels. You have four Gospels about Jesus. Those are biographies, right? You have a central figure in the story. It's, it's uh, telling truthful things about their life. That's a biography. Um, you have poetry in the Psalms. You have what we call prose discourse, which is just telling someone what to do. Okay. We, have that, we have the law in the Old Testament, and then we have all the epistles, whether they're from Paul, James, Peter, um, Jude, it doesn't matter. Those epistles are trying to, usually they're correcting your behavior, telling you what to do. And then you have prophecy. That's kind of a uniquely religious, biblical uh, genre, which we typically think of as telling the future. Right. But it can also be telling you if-then stuff, like if you don't quit sinning, then this is going to happen. If Israel doesn't turn back to God, they're going to be captured. Um, and so the last one we have is unique to uh, ancient Jewish literature, and that's called apocalyptic literature. Do you know? Huh? No? The book of Revelation. Right? Actually, the word apocalyptic and the word revelation, same word. The Greek word means to reveal or unveil. And so we say apocalyptic, we're often thinking about the end of the world. That's because when you read the book of Revelation, most people are thinking about the end of the world. And so now that word has kind of taken on another meaning. But um, apocalyptic literature is a style of literature that the book of Revelation is written in. Um, also, like some chapters in the book of Daniel, some other Old Testament prophets are written in those. And so for homework, I want you to find an example of each genre in the Bible. And I want you to tell me where each example fits into the big story. The Bible, the meta narrative. And that's going to be our launch pad to Bible study next week, the how to do Bible study next week.